So most of us realize that, that Satan's going to try to stop us. He, he does not want us following Jesus. It's Christianity 101. This is elementary. If we love the Lord, he wants to mess with our life. That's just the way it is. But what he wants to do more than that, and, and he's calculated, Satan's calculated in the way he opposes Christians and why he opposes Christians, all right? And so there's a, there's a pattern in God's Word that I just briefly want to mention tonight because I really sense this in my heart is that Satan has a way of bringing some of his greatest attacks, his greatest opposition, right before the point of a breakthrough in our life. So I don't title my sermons anymore but because we, we do so many series, but I guess if I was titling it, it would be talking about spiritual opposition before a breakthrough. The timing is the issue for me I want to talk about tonight. So in the natural, I want to talk about harvest. Uh, if you've been in church any amount of time, you know that harvest is synonymous with breakthrough. And throughout the, the scriptures, the, the people were very uh, agrarian people, okay? In the Old Testament and the New Testament, Jesus taught about fruit and farms and crops and herds and animals. And harvest was a big deal. And throughout the natural harvest, it's considered to be anything that we have planted, cared for, tended, worked with an expectation of a fruit, a product, such as a crop. Or we want our sheep to have some baby sheep and we want our mama cows to have baby cows. We want our herd to get bigger. And in the spiritual sense, it carries something similar. Except that it's not the physical product all the time. But here's what it is. It's anything you have planted seed toward. It's anything you've cared for. It's anything you've tended or prayed for or worked for or had faith for or you gave toward with some type of an expectation that either something was going to be produced or God was going to give an answer. So you might say it like this, harvest time is our point of breakthrough. So whatever I'm praying for, when it happens, that's breakthrough. That's my harvest time. Whatever I'm sowing toward, whatever I'm cultivating, whatever I'm, you know, working in my life through my Christianity, my spiritual disciplines, whatever I'm practicing them toward and sowing my life toward, when it happens, is our breakthrough. Now, I will tell you something about breakthrough, harvest, whatever we want to call it. Satan hates it. He hates it in the life of a believer uh, at, at a level that I don't know we can comprehend. You've probably done this study before because I know everybody here on Wednesday night are students of the Scripture. You guys are the cream of the crop. If you start digging around the Bible, you will find that Satan has a particular hatred for the people of God receiving any type of harvest or breakthrough that they've prayed for, labored for, gave toward, or sought after. He hates it. He will, he will do anything. Uh, by na his, in his very nature, his very nature, it's anti-breakthrough. It's anti-harvest. Uh, John 10 and 10 says he's a destroyer and a waster. Revelation 22 calls him the dragon, which is the devourer. The serpent, which is the deceiver. The devil, Diabolos, which is the slanderer. Hasatan, which means the adversary. All of these things are part of the nature of the enemy to try to stop you from receiving what God has for you. Uh, the Philistines, they, they attack David at the cave of Adullam in harvest time. They attack Shammah in his pea patch, not when he was planting the peas, right? Not when he was pulling the weeds around the peas, but when the harvest of the peas came up. They invaded Gideon's threshing floor, not when they were sowing the crops or doing the work of the crops or sweating out in the hot sun tending the crops, but they came down out of the hills when they were harvesting the crops. Now this message tonight, I, I wanna make something really clear. I, I have no intention to discourage anybody or to try to cause any kind of fear like, oh my God, Satan's coming after my breakthrough and my harvest. On the contrary, I wanna encourage you and help build your faith that if you are in the middle of a battle 
and you have said to yourself recently, what is going on? Why is it getting so hard? Why are all of this crazy stuff happening to me? If, if, if something is getting intense in your life, I can't, I'm not prophesying to you. I don't know what God's doing in your life, but I will tell you there's a pattern in this scripture that there's a very good possibility that you are approaching a point of breakthrough or harvest in that thing or in that situation. And so that's what I want to talk to you about. Now I'm going to be, you know, I'm an honest guy. I have no idea how Satan knows when we're approaching a harvest. I, I, I know he's not omnipotent. I know, I know that he's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere. He doesn't know everything. But somehow, whether it's through the cues of our life, studying people for millennia after millennia, or getting some type of information like he did about Job and the presence of God, I don't know. But I do know that if he can sense that there's something coming in your life as a payoff or an answer to prayer... I can assure you he's going to dial it up. He's going to take it to the next level. So what do we do with that? We, we, have, to, we have to gain strength from the fact that if it's getting hotter, that means I'm about to press the button that he doesn't want me to press. I'm about to pray the prayer he doesn't want me to pray. I'm about to give the gift he doesn't want me to give. I'm going to love on the person he doesn't want me to love on. There's something going on. So I want to talk to you briefly about two areas and then a little bit more lengthy about a third area that Satan seems to fight when you and I are getting close to breakthrough. The first one is when you're about to get an answer to a promise. Uh, 1 Samuel 30 and verse number 1, David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, and the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag, and they had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire. Everybody knows that story. They carried off David's family and everybody else's family. But what we don't associate a lot of times, by the way, this is one of, if not the lowest point in David's life right here. His own army decided they were going to kill him. David himself said, if I, I don't blame you. If I were you, I'd be wanting to kill me too. He's at the lowest point. Here's what we don't realize a lot of times, and you, you may know this. This attack occurred just a couple of months before David assumed the throne that God had promised him years earlier. He had gone through, you know, David had prom that God promised David the throne and anointed him to be the king in Saul's place. But, you know, he didn't go to the palace. He ended up in the wilderness and he had all these journeys that he went through. And right about the time the promise of God was going to come to pass, Satan took his whole family away. And for all that David knew, they were all dead. Now, here's the deal. The enemy could not stop God from delivering on his promise. That's what we got to get. If God's got an answer for you to a prayer, if his answer is yes, Satan cannot stop that. If God's got something coming for you that you've been sought and have been working toward, Satan is not God's equal. He has no ability. When God got ready to cast him down, he just fell like a, you know, just like a dead piece of weight out of heaven. Cast down to the earth. These cosmic battles we imagine in our mind like Thor and Loki and, and all that, that is not how Satan attacks God. He can't even look at God. God just thumped him down into the earth. He has no ability to stop God from delivering the answer. But So what does he do? He tries to discourage us to a point to make us give up before it comes, Right? Right before the throne, David was tested with discouragement. And the enemy does the same to us right before breakthrough. So what I'm telling you is if you have been holding on to a promise, man, that can be anything. The salvation of a loved one, a, a, a ministry, a vision, a, anything God's given you. If it's getting hot in your life, there's a good chance the answer's coming. The second thing is the family. Judges 15 and 1. After some days at the time of wheat harvest, Samson went to visit his wife with a young goat. And he said, I will go into my wife in the chamber. But her father would not allow him to go in. Now, in no way am I insinuating that, that Samson did things right or had a healthy family dynamic. 
just want everybody to know this dude was jacked up. He had been gone. He did some stuff he wasn't supposed to do. He thought he was going to roll back in town, see mama, and all was going to be fine. And, and they said, that's not going to happen. So the family comes under attack right around the time God gets ready to do something as an answer in your life. Think about this. And if you're married in here, and, and by the way, so, so thankful for our students in here tonight. Pastor Chris and Hannah are doing a great job. But if you're married in here, we don't have any students married, do we, Chris? Okay. I mean, it is Alabama, so I'm just saying. But we don't have any. They're not cousins, are they? Okay, just making sure. <laughs> if you're married in here, I want you to listen. Satan tried to divide Samson from his wife right at the point of harvest time. And I'm not going to unpack all this, but when you get close to God moving in your life, one of the first areas he tries to bring strife and division is with you and your spouse or with you and your family. And here's why. If the enemy knows that he can cause division within the family and break that unity, then he can hinder the harvest or the breakthrough because it's not just God sending the answer. It's us being in alignment to receive the answer. And we're communal people. We're not out by ourselves, And you're not going to be treating your wife like garbage and expect all the promises of God to flow into your life because it's time for breakthrough. That broken relationship relationship will break up the flow of God's blessing and it can happen in the family so God's favor falls on unity God's favor falls on uh, unity and not strife or division so I simply said that to say this when you go into a season where your family is just in a mess I want to encourage you and look it's hard I get it okay I get it I'm human too I want you to stop and think, maybe this isn't just that I have weird loved ones. And we all have weird loved ones, don't we? How many of you have weird loved ones? If you didn't raise your hand, you're probably the weird loved one because your other family member just raised their hand. It was, it's, and maybe we need to stop and think, hey, it's not just that we're a bunch of weirdos that love each other. Maybe there's more to this. I'm not a guy that thinks that there's a demon behind every bush and everything is about, you know, the devil attacking. And when you pull up the Chick-fil-A, if there's no parking spots, I don't think you got to, you know, rebuke Satan and try to find an empty place. I'm not, I'm not into all, any of that. You can take your little backslidden tail to Popeye's if you want to, but for the rest of us, we're going to serve the Lord in beauty and holiness and Chick-fil-A. Anyway, oh, that's not in my notes, I promise y'all can see. Maybe we need to think, though, maybe all this mess is happening in my family. Maybe, maybe I'm getting ill with my wife about something stupid. Or maybe my child is acting up unusually because Satan is trying to break up the unity because he knows that God is fixing to do something in my life. You know, if we look at the narrative of Scripture as a whole and the stories within it, We've got to realize that God moves, but we have to posture ourselves as well in seasons to be receptive of what God is doing in our life. And so sometimes the answer doesn't come because I won't repent and apologize to my family if I've been the one that stirred this up or maybe it's because I just won't deal with it you know and you know I think that in our culture today we some of us think we're being peacemakers but we're actually not we're, we're we're just keeping false peace by not making that family unit whole okay so those are the two things there's the time of a promise coming to, to, to be an answer, and then there's the attack on the family at breakthrough. Now, the Bible tells us that Satan is a defeated fallen angel. We know that. We also know, looking at history and reading scripture, that he is a master at intimidation. If you don't have the power to affect people, you have to find a way to make them quit, abort it, or affect themselves, and you do that through intimidation. You do that through intimidation. And listen, I'm not giving props to the devil. I'm well aware about what Charles Spurgeon said about giving glory to the devil. I'm not doing that. 
But I think it's really naive of us to think that a creature that once beheld the presence of the Ancient of Days face to face and had the ability to lead worship in heaven and, and was created at such a level that we can't comprehend, to think that he is not skilled at his trade after several millennia is being really naive on our part. He's good at what he does, and he is skilled, and, and, and he does a lot of things, but what I really want to talk about in the next 90 minutes tonight, I mean, nine minutes, 19 minutes, 40, whatever, minutes tonight, Satan has a way of timing things that are not that big of a deal in and of themselves, but he has, he has a way of timing them so that they all create the feeling of a flood at one time. To make things seem out of control. To make us think that it's beyond us and all these things are happening. And that Satan wants every one of us to put our head down and have this thought in our minds. It's hopeless. It's a hopeless situation. Any of the, have you ever noticed that when we start unpacking the, the, the things in our life that are giving us fits, it, we sit back and we go, that's not that big a deal. That's not that big a deal. That's not that big a deal. And that would never make me act like this. But all of a sudden, when I feel like it's all happening at one time, I, I told some of you guys this. I know I told the staff this uh, back before the summer and late spring when I told our staff that I, I felt like God had changed my preaching calendar. I do a calendar every year before the year begins with all the subjects that year that I'm going to cover. And God changed me in the spring, which I don't like change, but he doesn't care. He kind of does what he wants to do because he's God. I told the staff, I said, God wants me to do a summer series on the afterlife, the doctrines of heaven and hell. Man, I, I, when I tell you all hell broke loo loose in my life, I, I think that's an understatement. And I'm not going to go through all the crazy stuff that happened. And I remember one day almost laughing about it when Seth was in the hospital with a collapsed lung. I wasn't laughing at him, but I was laughing at the fact that you can't make this stuff up. You can't put all these pieces together. And I know that what it was is that Satan was trying to make me feel like it wasn't raining. It wasn't just a creek rising. That Floods were overwhelming my life. Everybody has seen the images of the Bahamas. God, God have mercy uh, at what Dorian has done to that. And we've seen the flooding. And that's what he wants us to feel like. That the flood is just overwhelming in our, our life. And so I want to take the last uh, five or ten minutes tonight and talk about Joshua in Joshua 3. In verse number 15 the scripture says, now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. Um, I'm not going to camp out there, but I just want you to know that this is not by chance that Joshua and Israel w could see and almost touch their answer. And right at harvest time, this huge barrier of a flooded river became their opposition between getting their harvest and staying on the other side. They were poised after 40 years waiting. Now, if you're Joshua, you got to wonder, this group of people that I came over here with were mumblers and grumblers and backsliders and full of doubt, and God let them wander around until they're, they all died in the wilderness, except for a couple of us. It's time to move on. We've rallied the troops. After 40 years, we finally encouraged enough faith that God's going to give us the answer. And as soon as he gets his marching orders, the Jordan is flooded. This, the point is the enemy will send these floods. They will be the highest they will be the broadest. They will be the most overwhelming the closer you and I get to whatever it is God has for our life. Our inheritance, our promise, our family. He will flood. What, what does that mean? To flood means that stuff that's normally okay in my life is getting out of the banks. It's getting at levels. It's always there. It's not necessarily anything new, but now it's higher than it should be. 
The parameters are being stretched. Things that I've managed for a long time, all of a sudden stuff is going haywire and they're stretching me and things are going to this level and my kids are going crazy and so-and-so got fired and the light bill went up and Mediacom, uh, Mediacom went up again. You know, and our budget's getting stretched. Um, Mediacom is definitely not of the Lord. There is part of the flood if you have Mediacom. And here's what Satan wants. He wants us to feel overran, flooded, out of control through our circumstances, our pains, our problems, our fears, our failures, our anxieties, our insecurities. Anything that can keep us from our inheritance. Um, Leah and I share something in common. Her family pastored a church that a couple of years after that I did too. And when I lived in that town, I've told you guys this. I had, I had the, the darkest, it was, it was great. We had great things, but I had the darkest season of my life. And I, I battled anxiety and depression. I didn't know what it was. I, I was having fits of rage and anger. And I lost 20 pounds and I got sick. And they were running tests. And I thought I was losing my mind. And the doctor put me on a drug that less than 1%. Now stay with me. I'm talking about things getting flooded right before breakthrough. Less than 1% of the people in the world who take it have any reaction. And I had a psychotic reaction, which is like down in the really tents of people. The, the doctor told me, he said, you can count on one hand the number of people in America who have psychotic reactions to flagell. Took them two weeks to find out. I had this crazy story, and I remember sitting on my back porch. And I'm being honest, you can think of me what you want. But I was sitting on my back porch having visions that the people were going to pull up in my yard and put a one of those jackets that button from the back on me and take me to the crazy house. And, and, and my mama, y'all don't know my mama, but she's a, she's a very sensitive to the Holy Spirit lady. She had come to stay with us because I was wigged out, man. And she said, I told her, I said, Mom, I think they're coming for me and I'm not going to be able to raise my kids and I'm losing my mind. And she said, well, son, you know, you did have a cousin that was in the crazy house her whole life. Man, when I got well, I called her. I said, what in the is wrong with you? Who would do that to their kid? Anyway, I, I'm still a little sore about it, to be honest with you. I remember the moment. I thought I was dying. Angela can tell you. I thought I was losing my mind. I thought I was dying. It was all these weird things. And I look back and what I realize is Satan was really trying to kill me. He, he was really trying to stop us from what God was doing in our life. And I remember the moment God gave me deliverance from it. And, it and, I, and I took anxiety meds for six months. I mean, I was shot. My nerves were shot. And God finally delivered me. And, and I want you to really quickly, Joshua and the people refused to be deterred by the flood. So I'm not going to read it for the sake of time. We can throw it on the screen. But in Joshua 3, 14 through 7, 17, the, the priests came down and, and their feet and their feet went into the water. Uh, they were bearing the Ark of the Covenant and the waters parted and the people passed over and they inherited the promised land because they refused to be intimidated. Now here's what I really want to tell you. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is just grit your teeth and, and stand your ground and not have all the answers but not let Satan scare you. Not let him overwhelm you. Not let him flood your mind. And sometimes you got to just tell yourself to just take a step forward. It's just a simple step forward. You got to refuse to quit and step forward. You got You don't have to run the whole race. You don't have to go the whole mile. You got to refuse to run away. You got to refuse to back up and you got to step forward. You got to refuse to give in the fear and trust the Lord. Uh, guys, I can't overemphasize this tonight. And I know this lesson is a lot, you know, simpler and, and, and less thought out than my normal teaching. But I really feel like God gave me this as a rhema word. I want you to know these people were not suicidal maniacs. None of them wanted to step off into a flooded river. 
If you've ever seen the power of a flooded river, it is not something you do. You know, I mean, that's, that's, that's redneck stuff, right? Hold my beer and watch this kind of stuff if you enjoy jumping in flooded rivers. Something's wrong with you, okay? These people did not want to just go jump in a flooded river. But they had a promise from God. And if they, you know, I love what God told them to do. He told the priest to step in. He didn't tell the priest to walk through. He didn't expect them to walk through the flooded Jordan. He just expected them to take a step. Just a step. And we've got to go back a few verses. If you look back in verses 10 through 13, this is the promise God gave them. If the priest will step in the water, I will part the Jordan and you'll go across on dry ground. They had a promise and so they, they came together with the courage to take that one step. You know, sometimes, sometimes when Satan is bearing down on your life, you don't have to take a lot of steps. You just got to take one step. It might even be a little step can be a baby step it can be sticking your tippy toe in the water kind of step for somebody it's not paying the church debt off it's just writing a tithe check when you think you can't afford it for somebody it's not fixing everybody's problems it's just loving that person that's hard to love but you love them for somebody it's staying when you want to leave and you stay for somebody else it's leaving when you want to stay but you leave for somebody, it's just holding your tongue when you want to speak. For somebody else, it's speaking up one word when you just want to be quiet. It may be something like joining a small group when you just want to hide. Or it may be teaching or stepping out when you think you can't. It's just a small step. So tonight I'm wrapping this up. Whatever, whatever you think is coming down on your life, whenever you think something is coming down on your life, you, you need to make sure you're right. There's no sin in your, your life. You need to make sure your relationships with the people you love are well. And don't be scared to be the first one to make them right, even when you're not wrong. And the lady said, Oh, you ladies are off tonight. You are not listening to me. And the men who are always right said, When spiritual opposition comes, it's, it, it, it's, it's possible you're really on the breakthrough. And the enemy's going to lie to you. He's going to try to convince us uh, that, that he's going to win and that our cause is hopeless. Remember, he just wants us to feel flooded, overwhelmed, hopeless situation. Because, you know, history, history teaches us that if a human being has even a shred of hope, they are, they are a very resourceful and, and tenacious creature. People have lived through some of the worst atrocities that the world has ever known just because they just had a shred of hope. And he knows that if he leaves us with hope, we're going to keep following the Lord. And so he tries to make us feel hopeless. Never, ever, ever get to a place to where you feel hopeless. If there's breath in your lungs, there's hope. And so Satan's going to try to convince you you're hopeless. I close with this tonight. Some of you have, um, have read the screw tape letters. It's one of, one of C.S. Lewis's uh, classics. Uh, I, I'm a Lewis fan because the man could sit down and talk theology with the greatest scholar alive. And he could turn around and write a children's story that would teach about the Trinity and, and mesmerize all ages. He's brilliant. And he wrote all kinds of different things. The Screw Tape Letters is a fictional story about the demon Wormwood, who is Screw Tape's nephew, and his job as a demon is to try to convince his young man or his patient to abandon his faith in Christ. And so it's a reversal, it's a flip-flop. The story is the dialogue between Wormwood and Screwtape as he coaches him on how to try to make this young man abandon his faith in Christ. Now, Bruce Edwards uh, was a uh, C.S. Lewis Foundation fellow. He wrote this about the story. He said, perhaps the most enduring lesson to be learned from the Screwtape letters is that diabolical lies can be resisted and refuted by steadfastly holding on to the truth of who God is, 
who we are in Him and by being knowledgeable and vigilant to oppose the devil's schemes through prayer, scripture, worship, and most of all, the company we keep. The reason God has you here tonight, friends, the reason we're all here tonight is just be- not just because it's First Wednesday. Thank you for coming. It's because part of the way we overcome the enemy, part of the way we triumph as the, 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 co- the collective spiritual house of God is that we don't battle against him alone. We know God's with us, but we also walk together. The people of God, hand in hand. And so tonight, I want to encourage you. If you feel like he's trying to stop you from something in your life, you know what he's already told you. I know this because I've done this a few times. He's already told you that going to church is a waste of your time. He's already told you, look, you tried it and look what happened. He's already told you there's better ways and other things. I want to tell you that you need to know the word. You need to be filled with the Spirit, and you need to know how to pray. But you know what you also need? You need the fellowship of your spiritual community that stands beside you and comes together. And even if we don't have time tonight to chit-chat and have this long dialogue, you and I have walked into the spiritual habitation of the Lord. We are living stones being knit together and built up as the temple of the Holy Spirit in this world. And where we are, He inhabits and we, we receive strength to overcome. We're not going to stand in heaven one day individually and declare that we overcome the enemy. But as the collective voice of the redeemed of God, we will stand together and declare that we've overcome him by the word of our testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. The people that you and I, God, has called us in the community with are part of our journey. So. My job tonight is to tell you, don't give up. Don't let Satan overwhelm you. You may feel like it's a flood, but I promise you, he cannot do anything to your life that God does not allow him to do. And if you're part of a spiritual community like Noah Wood, you're not by yourself. You are never by yourself. So would you stand with me tonight? Uh, the hour's late, 737. I know we've got to pick up kids from Noah Wood Kids. And I love Pastor Landis. I don't want him to hate me. We, we work together, so I need him to love me. So I'm not going to hold you any longer. So we're going to pray where we are. Now look, if you know the person beside you and they're comfortable, would you reach over and grab their hand or put your hand on their shoulder? Um, if you don't, then certainly be discreet and don't freak anybody out or scare anybody to death or anything like that. But this is part of our victory that we walk this thing together. We're going we're gonna to see the opposition, but we're going to overcome. Father, and pray for your neighbor right now. Father, I pray for and with my people, my, my community, my tribe, my base, my family, my, my, my church. God, my church with the little C and my church with the big C. God, we stand together tonight in somebody that we're holding hands with, somebody that we have a hand on their shoulder has felt overwhelmed today. They felt overwhelmed this week. They felt like that if it ain't one thing, it's 10, a flood, a flood, a flood. And God, they felt like quitting. They felt like giving up. They felt like God ain't, you ain't, you're not listening they felt like it's hopeless. God, I pray right now that just by the squeeze of that hand or the touch on that shoulder and the the infusion and the infilling of the very real person of the Holy Spirit right now, lift them up. Lift them up, Lord. Let them know that they're not alone. They may not know 10 names of people in here tonight, but if they claim us, we claim them. They're not alone in this house. They may be a guest or a visitor, God, but our doors are open. Our hearts are open. We claim them and we call them family tonight. And we bear them up. We strengthen them right now in the name of Jesus. We're not telling them something silly like all their problems are going to disappear. We're not telling them that we can make everything better. We're telling them that we can hold them up love them up, live them through, pray them through tonight, God. Encourage them that there's hope. There's hope, God, that you're not going to let the enemy 
Sometimes preachers misquote that scripture, Lord, and they say when the enemy comes in like a flood, you'll raise the standard. Lord, that's not what your word says. Your word says when the enemy attacks like a flood, you will raise up a standard and an offense against the thing of the enemy. God, if we feel like we're hopeless, we're at the point of breakthrough. We lift our family up tonight. We love them. We pray you encourage them. God, and right now we pray with the Tillmans. God, as they chase your will for their life. God, we agree with them. We partner with them. We believe, God, that that, that Vienna will never be the same because they said yes. God, that that region will never be the same because they said yes. And God, that they'll know that they don't go alone as they've shared. We go together. God, and we pray that you speak to hearts tonight financially to bless them. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.